Yeah, I know this is coming out late in the day compared to when I usually like to get it out. But look, it's just it's it's been a day. OK, and or episode nine. Um, and as before, I'm not entirely sure how much I'm going to have to say about this uh, for a similar reason to what I said last time. The stuff that's good is still good. So short of going point for point through the entire plot, uh, there isn't a ton for me to say. I will say this does kind of break up the format that we've had up to this point, which was three episodes sort of fin- forming like a little mini story in and of themselves. The first three charting and or uh, getting off the planet that he was living on. The next three being about the heist. We've now completed another three. He's still in jail. <laughs> Uh, that hasn't changed. I was assuming he'd be out by the end of this episode. He's not. So, uh, the show's broken its format a little bit. Um, now granted that format was based partly on a little bit of assumption on my part. And I think I might've read that somewhere or maybe it was just something somebody put in comments. I can't remember now, but, um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of interesting. And this is, this is an episode that fits under the category of what I would call the noose tightening style episodes where it's not really a moving pieces on the board to get them in position for the next thing kind of thing. Everybody is more or less in a very similar place, if not the same place at the end of this episode that they were last. But I don't just mean geographic place. I mean, most of them as characters in terms of their goals and what they're doing, the majority of them have not really shifted. Um, but the, the situation, the things that, breed tension. All of it is just tightening around these characters. With Mon Mothma, you know, to what ability she can fund the rebels and to what degree she can influence the Senate at all. So, you know, both legitimately and under the table, trying to help out the resistance efforts, her ability to do that is just shrinking and it's just closing in on her. The investigation into Andor, it's it's closing in and it's costing the people who have known him. And I will note that while I wasn't a uh, huge fan of the torture scene, I do appreciate that it was basically a, um, a scene where what was done was not something we had to visually witness and not even like kind of what they did with Han Solo in um, uh, Return of the Jedi, where the torture starts and then it cuts away and you just hear the screaming. She does scream, which I don't I don't really love having to see, but at least it's not, you know, we're not having to watch physical abuse being endured. Now, that doesn't make the torture any less monstrous just because it's of a different nature. But, you know, if you're going to have a torture scene, which <sighs> depicting the lengths that a fascist government will go to is one of the few situations in which I think an argument can be made that maybe you do need a torture scene or at least a strong implication of one. I, I appreciate it not going as uh, gratuitous as these things often do. Not that I would have expected Disney Plus to do that, just as a general thing. Appreciate it. Um, the situation at the at the prison, it just feels like it's tightening as the oldest guy on their team, just he's slowing down more and more. And... All these situations, like, again, by the end, most people are in the same place they were, but everything's just getting squeezed. And so this is a good um, ratcheting up tension kind of episode. Um, And also, the more I think about what happens plot-wise in the jail, in the prison, the more I like it because there's a couple of things going on. First of all, there's where the episode actually gets its title. No one is listening. Nobody's monitoring them. They don't have to because they've built a system where by ruling through fear and select amounts of retribution, punishment, and exerted force, they have a prison population that will regulate itself. They don't have to watch them all the time. And this is, again, something that fascism not only builds but needs to because no government no matter how powerful it believes itself to be has the resources to monitor everything that might be trying to undermine it now when a fascist government feels threatened they will do everything they possibly can to 
uh, make the punishments for undermining them so extreme that no one would try anyway, but they can't realistically monitor everybody. And so a prison setup like this where, yes, there are people watching them, yes, there are systems in place, but minute to minute, day to day, nobody's watching these people. They regulate themselves. They don't have to watch them. So that's the first thing about that, really driving home that point. And then more than that, though, as um, I forget the character name, but as Andy Serkis's character, finally, after people have been telling him and being like, look, something's wrong. Something has gone very wrong on here. Like beyond the fact that our lives are absolute garbage um, for as long as we're here. What he finds out that people who were released were just sent to another level and put back to work. And that when one of the floors figured out that that had happened, they all got wiped out. I like that that is what brings him over. Because while I'm going to hesitate to call Andy Serkis's character a collaborator of the fascist a regime. He's a victim of it. But then again, all honestly, most collaborators of fascism are also victims of fascism in one way, shape, or form. But that's that's really not the point I want to make with him. The point I want to make with him is he thought that, look, this is terrible. This sucks. But if I follow the rules, if I do what they tell me, I'll be okay, or as okay as one can be in the circumstances I'm in. And that belief is necessary to get people to fall in line. Because again, you can't watch everybody all the time. So if you make them believe, if I do what they want me to, I'll be okay. And as long as I am doing the correct things, I will be treated as well as anyone can be. It makes you less likely to act up and push back because you just think all I have to do is obey the rules. Maybe the rules are screwed up. Maybe they're unfair. If you think you know the rules and you think how this works, then you can trick yourself into thinking, I'll just obey the rules and I'll be okay. So when that illusion is broken, when he realizes that the game is rigged, the rules are arbitrary. They're not enforced in any way. They are twisted to benefit those in power, and they exist not as a means of giving guidance for how he or anyone else should behave in order to receive some kind of reward, even if that reward is just getting out of prison. No, those rules exist to trick you into conformity, into thinking that those in power are also following those rules, but they're not. That's not how fascism works. Fascism has no rules. And part of how it gets into power and stays in power is by convincing everyone who is not on its side that there are rules and will totally abide by them. Because if everyone else realized that they're not abiding by the rules, then they would put more effort and force into stopping them. Then those who would oppose fascism would themselves disregard the rules in order to stop this. Because if somebody's cheating, but you're playing fair on the assumption that they are too, they're going to win. And this show just continues to show such an excellent, excellent understanding of how fascism behaves, manifests, comes into power, holds on to it, and where its weaknesses are. Because fascism is all about the projection of power. But it has to seem more powerful than it is. Because by its nature, it cannot be truly benefiting that many people in a way that doesn't come with a crap ton of asterisks and conditions to it. So... Since it benefits a minority, it requires the appearance of being so strong that even if the opposition is the, mi- is the majority, they still can't win. But the best way for them to do that is to appear as if the opposition is not the majority, even though, by and large, 
it almost always is. But if it doesn't know that it is, and if it thinks that the game is fair and they're losing fair and square, fewer people will push back as hard as they have to. So yeah, this is still really good. It's really good. I am at this point getting not only exactly what I wanted out of this show, um, because I said before it started, what I want is a ground level examination. What happens to normal people? What happens to day-to-day -day people just trying to live their lives under the empire? It's not only given me that, it's given me a glimpse into the lives of the people who work for the empire, but are still victims of its systems, even though they also empower and help perpetuate those systems. And it is showing such a good understanding of fascism that this, this show is proving to be more than I could have hoped for right now. And given that it's just progressively telling its story and it's not building to a specific climax that everything's going to hinge on, I am not even worried. I get nervous about finales, especially for anything that feels like it's building. This is just going through telling its story. Even if the last episode ends up being something I don't really care for, what it's done up to this point, and like, it's not like the last episode's next week, just to be clear, in case you aren't keeping track of that, but like everything it's done so well up to this point will not lose any of its value, even if this thing somehow drops the ball towards the end. This is, this is really good. And or. Episode 9. What did you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon is how we pay the bills around here. If you're able to assist in any way, shape, or form. Even if you can't, like, share, and subscribe. Also help me out. Not too much pressure about that, though. Try and take a relaxed attitude around here so you can come on back next time you need a break. All right, time to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfulla, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Oliver B., Melinda Walters, Imudelki, Leotha Boyd, Toy Loli, Becky Sparks, Phrenobulax, The Poodle, Zach, Bookworm, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Adam R.D.L. Taylor, Shayla Gourlay, Brendan LaRose, and T.T. Thank you for your support. If you want to hear me try and say your name while this little guy tries to chew on my earrings, well, you can check out the Patreon or the support tiers that get you a shout out. Thanks so much. You are a pain in my butt.